welcome back everyone to my last video. I think last time I said I would think about what I would say in my last video. Um, but I'll just give a refresher here in terms of the stuff we talked about. Again, if you're a newer player and you just watched all this at one time, and you're again looking for a place to you know try to understand, again we're going back to the sieves. I said this before, but go back to the sieves, try to learn how the, each sieve, like which buildings you're going to go for. Um, again, really practice to have this good building formation. It's really important. It's pretty important for sure. Practice the after you get that down. When you're consistently doing that, play against AI. Practice the raiding. Again, try not to over raid, not to under raid. Then next after that, probably work on building these other buildings to expand. Or instead of that, you could work on. Um, well, you still would be doing, you try to be expanding at the same time, but like again, trying to hit the secondary raids on these extra golds, on the potential spots for castles, try to hit those spots. Um, but then, yeah, like working on expanding. And then, like I said, usually but when you're starting to expand into TCs, it's also the same time you're patrolling here. So trying to make sure that you're taking the map control. Um, but yeah, but then, yeah, trying to go expand for split pushes and stuff like that getting your eco up and running that's kind of kind of your last steps there grabbing the relics all that all that good stuff and again a lot of it's just about mechanics and it just comes down to practice and again a lot of the practice you can just get 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 versus the ai so um and then we'll talk about maybe i'll make a like i said a future video about the market stuff once i start to learn a bit more about it but um aside from that um there's not really much else to cover here um there's some things i was thinking about though was you notice, well, not in this particular case, but if you're against sieves that have like strong raiding units like paladins or eagles, then going on stone, not necessarily right away, but some, you know, like in the mid game can be decent because as you can see, there's still some areas that are quite exposed to to raids. And I talked about it earlier, but this spot's not like super heavily exposed, but still, like later on, if they did mass a lot of paladins or something like that, they could just come over here and just like kill all you know kill all these villagers and stuff like that and there's 20 villas here so that wouldn't be good so um, getting castles up in your base for like the late game is really important it prevents hussars and and paladins and all that stuff from really being effective because you just have castles in your base it allows you to really focus on the front um, because yeah if you do lose all your castles in your base then if the player gets good enough cavalry units they can basically just raid you to death and um, that's not good so um, getting castles up in your base later on is can be quite important. Um, aside from that, uh, let's see. We talked about the raiding. Again, trying to mass up units on the side, making quite a decent amount of siege units before you push in. And then when you do push in, again, understanding that um, usually you know, push creating units on the side like this comes at the cost of having more units in the front. So you might have to play a little bit more defensive in the front here, or at least not give up being able to commit to extra positions. Um, and like I said, if they, they're they going to have to send more army to this side, so usually what you have to do is if they are pushing you, then they're probably not going to have the army to send to this side. Um, so if they are pushing you and then they fall back, then that means they're probably going to commit to here, so that means either push here or go and commit more to this side. Or... Um, if they aren't pushing you, then again, that means either push here or move army over here to commit to, to here again uh, on, a, on a heavier split push. But usually you have to, you have to move your more mobile units. Um, having said that, actually getting again on stone in the mid game is quite good because if you run on a stone early on like this, right, then when you do push areas like this, you want to be able to be able to castle these areas to take control of the area because just pushing here is fine and, and having units here is fine. But again, they can always mass more units in the middle and then push you back. But if you have a castle here, then it really limits the distance at which they can push you back. Um, and the same is for split pushing. You know, uh, if you split push and you get up on top of a hill, like there aren't any hills here, but let's say you're on here and they're split pushing here. If you push here, right, ideally you can get the map controlled to get this hill here, right? Even though this hill is actually not that important here. <laughs> Whoa. But like um, maybe this hill, right? You want to be able to have the stone at the time and the villagers there to be able to build the castle there, and then that'll really give you a foothold up on the hill, right? Because if you just push up a hill, and then they send more military to fight it off later on, right? 
then you're just going to lose control again. You know, if you get the castle up there, though, you might not lose control of the hill, and then you can build, you know, again, more seed workshops or other buildings, right? And then push from that position and then gradually kind of work your way in on them, right? Um, so uh, those are all things to think about. Split pushing, again, trying to another uh, avenue to improve upon could be to set weight, um, control groups on the building so that it's easier just to go to them. Um, usually, like I said, going, going to them is more efficient than actually, like, doing the whole, like, queue up like you know so but if you have a lot of buildings or something like that then queuing up like that and just selecting the barracks can be fine instead of going to a wall but it's whatever um so that's another area to improve on and then lastly is something i really didn't talk about but unit control is pretty important so at least from what i've seen like again i have six seven eight here on these buildings here so that still gives you quite a bit of leeway in terms of being able to use one through five as reasonable keys. 9 and 0 would probably be unreasonable for most people because it's just a lot of a, it's a quite a big reach for, for a lot of people from where their hand normally is and also it requires kind of like touch typing skills to be able to press those which is very difficult as well to be able to correctly identify those keys um, across the keyboard. Um, but, uh, but yeah having 1 through 5 still gives you some versatility in terms of your control groups and I would just kind of advise that I, th I think the best thing, the most important thing, is to keep your um, your most um, cost efficient units usually. Not necessarily cost efficient, but maybe the units that are most vulnerable. So, like an example, like Huns or like CA are quite vulnerable, low armor, and um, the keeping them alive is very like they they do a lot of like DPS damage per second. And so, like having control groups for your your cap archers to keep them, you know, safe, so you're not taking damage is quite important. Um, you can also add like again paladins and the paladins and helms if you make those on on those control groups as well. Um, but for the most time, for the most point, like most times when you patrol in with your paladins and helms, they just die so quickly that you just have to constantly reset the control groups on those groups. And it's probably just better. Yeah, it's not probably better. I mean, you can if it works for you, but it's not really a big deal if you don't set the control groups on them because it's like you're just losing the unit so fast constantly having to recontrol group might as well just like whatever with cab archers you keep along for a while so having control groups is nice because it's like by going to the control groups it allows you to go back to that position really quickly without having to clicking it on the map and it allows you to micro the units a little bit better um even having control groups like just um not like not like control groups like for each like group of cav archers on the side or paladin or whatever on the side but just having all the units control group can be nice as well because then it allows you to go to you know the flank where the, where that units are actually fighting much faster so like for example if these were units are on the flank and I maybe I had some cav archers there but I put these on three then if I'm over here I can just go to my units here like again you have your buildings here but maybe you're pushing here if you put these units that were here on a control group then you can just go up to the control group faster Again, that's a little bit. That's probably a nice thing to do because again, it's like let's say you have your you have cav archers on one and two, or bomb archers, or siege you know, siege or whatever, or traps or whatever, one and two, something like that. But then you have like a split push here, maybe a split push or a mid push here and a split push here, right? You could just do you know one and two for your main groups. Um, you could have three be the uh, three could be your units on top, four could be your units down in the bottom, and then five maybe could just be like. Uh, uh, like your trebs or something in the middle or five or three could be your trebs in the middle and then four and five or whatever right kind of mixing up those control groups just kind of trying to work on uh, controlling your units better and being more cost efficient that's something that again a lot of dmers i don't think are really amazing at um but definitely somewhere for a lot of players to improve especially myself um but uh yeah and then um let's see beyond that i would say Knowing how to eco is quite important, so I'll just briefly talk through this stuff, and I guess you'll have to, people will have to um, kind of review it later on. Um, but okay, just remember again, you start with a lot of wood, a lot of food, a lot of gold, right? Um, gold is usually going to be your limiting resource, just because in, in order for gold not to be a limiting resource, usually you'd have to create a unit that's two to one in like wood or gold, or wood or, wood or food. And the thing is, is that realistically, there aren't many, like, there's only a couple units that are two to one in food to gold, and that's champion, and, um, like, elephants are almost two to one, even not, not even quite that. And so the thing is, is that unless you're making, like, a ton of champions, you're not going to run out of gold, you're not going to run out of food before you run out of gold, right? And so, 
there are some exceptions. For example, Goth is one case where you're making a lot of infantry, so you might actually run out of food before you run out of run out of gold if you're spamming a lot of infantry. Um, and um, the reason why that's important is that you want to make sure that by the time you are running out of the food, you have enough farms to be able to keep the production going that you need, right? Um, and that means you have the villagers. And so um, usually what I like to do is instead of pretending like I have 20k wood and 20k food, I really pretend like I have 15k wood and 15k food. Because realistically, you kind of need to allot 5,000 food for the villagers, 100, 100 or so villagers. And you realistically need to allot about 5,000 wood for all the buildings that you're building. So you even have less than 2 to 1. But again, there's only really two units and with food and food to gold that really qualify for the um, that food to gold ratio again, namely champions and paladins. And um, for gold, it's also quite rare. I mean, you have um, boats are very heavy wood to gold, but most times you're not playing water maps. Um, uh, the other heavy wood to gold unit is the sea dram. All these other siege units are basically one to one gold to wood. Um, and then all range units are basically heavier on gold than wood, so wood's still not a limiting factor, which means if we're going to talk about market, which we're really not to talk about now, but almost always you're going to sell wood as part of the way you're marketing because wood is usually never a limiting, um, it's usually, it's not, it's not always not, it's not necessarily, a, it's never a limiting factor right away. You're always going to run out of, um, I was going to run out of gold before you run out of wood, but it doesn't mean you're not going to run out of wood fast. Like, honestly, if you're making a lot of, like, wood gold units and, they're, you know, that means your wood gold units are dying, well, you're going to run out of gold fast, but then once your gold income kicks up, like, you're going to still be able to create units, but you're going to run out of wood then after you start making more units, right? Because you're not making food units, so then, yeah. So, so in terms of ecoing, right? Always, usually, again, gold's going to be the limiting factor initially, when you know, after you make all your units. But then it's all about being able to figure out what's the next what's the next limiting factor. Is it gonna be wood? Is it gonna be food? You know, and usually again it's just determined by what unit is dot what what unit are you constantly having to make. So you know, for like I said, like Koreans, you might be losing war wagons or siege a lot, right? That means you're gonna be losing a lot of wood, wood and gold. Again, you're gonna saturate your golds early on so you can maintain the gold production. But then you also have to make sure that you saturate the, you know, make sure you have villagers on wood in order to be able to maintain the constant production of uh, wood villagers. If you're still like Franks, then, you know, most of your um, gold and, or most of your resources are just going to be lost in paladins. Paladins are food and gold. So in order for you to, um, in order for you to um, prevent, you know, from going just totally, uh, prevent yourself from being idle in production, you're going to want to make sure that you make farms right away. And I think it's important, again, with um, with the Civic Franks to make farms right away. And, and this is something, again, I didn't really understand necessarily. Like, it was one of those things where it's like, oh, I still have 6k food. I don't need to make farms yet. I don't have to make farms until, uh, you know, I'm basically at 1,000 food or whatever, right? But really, it's better. The more farms you get, the, the, the faster you get the farms, the better. The, the reason why is that if you make the farms earlier, then um, if you make the farm, the, the downside of making like the downside to maybe not making the farms as early is that maybe you can't get your population as high, you can't get your military as high, because now you have maybe you I don't I don't think you can though honestly like the, the downside would be like you make your farms earlier, but now you spent more resources in the villagers and uh you can't get your military pop as high like let's say you still have like 4k food um but you've already hit pop cap right if you had 4k food then you you could still make paladins right but now you can't make paladins because you have too many vill you have villagers so it's it's really about finding that balance like you you don't want to you don't want to um you don't want to put no vill you don't want to put like zero villagers on farms and then you know, basically have to transition all of your villagers to farms when the food runs out. Uh, you know, because the thing is, is that, um, like, again, it, it might allow you to get, like, a large number of paladins early on, but then if your push fails, like, early on, like, your first push fails, which a lot of times it doesn't, you know, you can't just push somebody outright. But, again, some games you can. If they have all four gold, you could. But um, if the first push fails, then you're going to be, like, at a sta standstill in terms of the ego. 
and if they ecoed behind you and they were able to survive the first first push, then they'll be able to push back quite hard. Especially if you didn't have the food. If you run out of food and you don't have a lot of villagers, that's really gonna be a tough thing. So the the real thing is actually it's not about it's about really weaning yourself off of like it's about like weaning yourself I don't know if weaning is the right word. But um letting the food kind of dry up, like letting the initial food go down, but at the same time by the time it reaches zero, you want to have your the correct number you want on food, you know. And that's not always easy to kind of under. That's not always easy to get right. But um, but yeah. So for example, in like a civ like um, Koreans or something like that, which you, you're not going to be really spending any food really, probably for the most part. With Koreans. You know, if you're just going for like really heavy siege and war wagons, you know, you probably need like 40 on wood, 40 or 50 on wood. So maybe early on, you know, you have your like 40, 40 or so, 50 on gold or whatever, right? But maybe early on, you just try to get like 25 or so on wood, right? 25, 30, something like that, right? Not, not quite at your 50 or 60. Again, I don't know if 50 or 60 is right. It seems like if I had to guess, it'd probably be somewhere between like 40, 50, and 60. But anyways, get like 30 on wood or 25 on wood. And then as you see your wood starting to drop, you know, more and more, add some more villagers to wood. You know, but again, obviously add more villagers to, add more villagers to wood as long as your population is, uh, is like far enough. Like if you're at 105 pop like I am right now, and let's say, you know, you need more villagers on wood. It makes sense to just add the villagers on the. It makes sense to just add the villagers on the wood now, like add more villagers on the wood now, because the reality is, is that like, I, there's no way in hell that I'm gonna be able to mass up enough war wagon. Like, I'm not gonna be able to go from 105 to 200 pop, but make 85 units without a fight. You know, I'm gonna probably be constantly fighting here, so I'm never gonna really be hitting the pop cap anyways. So it doesn't really make sense to just like. It doesn't really make sense if my units just cost wood and gold to to um to you know it doesn't make sense not to make the villagers when I'm that far from 200 pop. But if I was closer, you know, if I was like again, if I was like 30 on wood, but I had like 180 pop or something like that, right? Maybe I would just hold off, right? Hold off, wait to pop cap, right? And and then you know, but if I was like 1k, if I was like, you know, 1k wood away from from running out, then I would definitely be adding villagers because it's like at that point, if I don't, I don't have enough wood to pop cap anyways. So that's really, I think, what you have to think about. You got to think about, do I have enough resource to even pop cap the military? And if the answer is no, then just make more villagers, you know. And so that's not, it's not always easy to, you know, if you're making paladins, then it's like, again, it's like, I don't know. Like the reality is, is you always pop cap over time. Like if you have just like five villagers on food, if you waited long enough, you could you could get enough paladins, you know, to pop cap. But the reality is, is can you pop cap in a in a like sensible way? Can you pop cap before like they fight? You know, before the fight starts. <laughs> you know, and so if you can, then you know maybe go for that. And if you can't, then just add villagers, right? So if the game is just if if the game is in like a constant mode where there's just constant fighting, right? Then maybe it's just better to um, maybe it's just better to uh, keep making villagers, right? But if the game is in this mode where it's like okay, both players have kind of established footholds on these two hills or whatever, it doesn't really make sense to just keep make, to make villagers at that point. Just wait it out. Wait till you get the resources. Then make heavier, make harder pushes. Because the thing is, is that if they wait it out and they play defensive, and they wait to mass at like 120 military or whatever, right? And you just add 120 villagers. Yes, your eco will be will be fine. And yes, you will be able to replenish the military use better than they will. But the reality is, is that if they have 120 military and you have 80, they'll probably take a good enough fight where they don't have to really worry about as like having to they don't have to they don't need as much ego to replenish their army because they didn't lose as much and the fact is is that with 120 military they probably get they have a better chance at probably taking a 
they have a better chance at like taking a position on a hill than you do at taking their hill. Like you, they don't really have to worry about you taking their hill because they have so much army. In fact, they could even have 80 military here. If, if they had a castle here and a castle here, they could just keep 88 military here and take the other 40 and just kill another hill, right? They basically out, could outright just overrun another area that doesn't have any army at all in it, right? And then secure that position. And that could be, you know, really important. Uh, that could be really important later on. Again, and they could and they could basically take that position without even without even losing any units, right? They could just use all the extra units in siege or whatever, take the position, and then reconverge basic based on or reconverge as a whole army, 120 units, and then push from that hill onto your eco or something like that, right? And you can't stop it because it's a fairground fight, right? You just have too much. They just have too much army. It just becomes like a death ball. So basically, what I'm saying here is just. It's it's not it's not a perfect science. I don't know what the hell I'm saying. Again, you gotta wean yourself into the we have a wean. You gotta freaking wean. If again, if you I would say like what I've heard from the better players is that like if you're going like Franks or something like that, and you're making paladins or just any food unit in general, then basically your first town centers like you want to make farms like basically right away. Again, you're not gonna need the farms. Like your food's definitely gonna be high still, but again, it prevents you from by making farms right away, it prevents you from having to need all the extra villagers later on, and you can keep like a very high military, a very high military throughout, if that makes sense, I guess. And like early on, you're gonna early on after the first couple fights or something for map control, you're gonna be dropping to like 120, 130 pop anyways, so you could definitely use like some villagers there, but then once you get to You know, I don't know how to say it. Once, once, once the first fights have kind of settled and the castles are up, right? Then there's kind of this point where there's kind of this point where um, you know you've gotten your gold villagers mining away, right? And it's all about um, I don't know. Like you got your gold villagers mining away, and um, the castles are up, so now you have a little bit more time to mass. You know? So, and if you get those farms up early, like, you, you have time to mass, but you don't probably have enough time to mass like crazy. So, like, if you're at 130 pop. You probably don't have enough time to mass like 70 more military units, but maybe you have enough time to mass like another 40 more or 50 more. And so making like, yeah, if you just go for like the no eco approach, like I'm just not going to make any villagers there. I'm just going to mass up. Well, what they're probably going to do is they're just going to go for villagers and kind of a, like they're not going to wait as long to attack. And then when, when you guys attack each other, when both players attack, the player that, that, went for the eco, their military numbers are going to be quite similar to are going to be quite similar to the person that was trying to mass except they'll have more villagers so they'll be able to remass better so it'll be a pretty even fight early on but then they'll have some better eco later I don't know I think this is per particularly an issue with the food units honestly because with like the wood and gold units if you're just if your sim is just really heavy wood and gold it seems like I don't know. I feel like if your sim's really heavy on wood and gold, then I just feel like you could just make a bunch of villagers and then just constantly be fighting the wood and gold unit. Like as long as you could get okay trades, I don't know. I don't really know what I'm saying at this point. It's kind of a hard thing to understand, I guess. So like, it's kind of a hard thing to to um. I I don't know if I quite fully understand what I'm talking about right now either. <laughs> Honestly, but. I'm just, hopefully y'all understand that I'm just saying that you don't want to, the ideal situation is one where you're basically, you're basically making as large of an army as you can, um, without floating like the extra resources really, but at the same time not totally abandoning, abandoning the economy.
So, for example, like Paladin. Paladin usually takes like 50 on food and like maybe 50 on gold, something like that, right? But instead of doing that, like if you put like 20 or 30 on food early on, like before the food runs out, you can sit like on that 20 or 30 on food for a long time. Like you don't have to be at 50 on food. And then that again allows you to have the extra military. Whereas if you do it really late, if you just you can have a you can have a stronger push early on if you just use up all your food early on, but not make, don't make any like don't make any of the don't make any villagers. You can have a stronger push with more paladin early on. But then if that push fails again, you're gonna get you're gonna have no eco to really to fall back upon. So you have to take a really good trade early on. So again, I guess that's kind of the that's I guess that's kind of the whole point here is like. Anytime you go for less eco and more military, you also you always have to to try you always have to try to um, take better trades. And if you can't take better trades, then you're gonna fall behind. So if you're somebody that like you can eco fast and then also take good trades with like good uh, unit control and like good like usually good split pushing is the way to do it. Because again, if one player is just sending all to middle and the other place player is just sending all to middle then the player that invests more in military is probably going to win, even without having the micro units. But if you're somebody that like split pushes quite well, right, and you have really good unit control, then the other player could have more army, but like superior unit control could make up for make up for that. But if both players had, are on equal footing, then again, it's one of those cases where like if there's a if there's a part of your map that you need to be quite secured, like the gold is really important to you or something like that, then you have to make sure you mass up a lot of army and not don't try to eco too fast because if you eco too fast and you have a gold center and they just go for a heavy push on your middle then you're gonna lose all so um, so yeah but then once you get to like a, like the 120 130 villagers it depends on your civ some civs are like even 100 villagers or whatever but once you get to that point and the game kind of like stabilizes or whatever then it doesn't really matter at that point. You still, I mean, you can still mass up military if you want to make like bigger pushes or whatever, but it, I mean, if you mass up military and they have the same villagers, it's going to be the same thing. They're, you're both going to mass up military. But to be fair, like you do need, you need to mass up military in certain situations because like castles are like kind of like a, they're kind of like military on their own, right? Because they, um, they fire arrows and stuff like that. So like if you both are like basically zero military, you can't push anywhere, you know, you have to be able to, even if you have even if you have uh, some military, right? You still just can't push castles really reliably, right? I guess, especially against other military, right? You have to mass up in order to be able to, because the more you mass military units, the the less value like the castle is in comparison, and like yeah, but the same is true for hills though. Like the more military they have, the more value the hill is, you know, versus like one unit, you know, what I'm saying. So if the castle's on a hill, then or if the, if the military is on a hill, then I don't know. I don't know. So hopefully, I don't really want to talk about that anymore. Just um, eco, fa eco, you know, eco as fast as you can trade reliably. If you can trade reliably with um, low numbers against higher against higher military or whatever like that, then all the power to you. As long as you can trade reliably, and if you can't trade reliably against larger numbers then maybe you need to mass more so yeah I don't know what else I'm saying um, yeah so paladins like 50 and usually I just go based on like the wood numbers so like heavy siege heavy gold wood like Korean stuff like that's gonna be like probably like 50 on wood or something like that Again, probably like that. Like usually, the gold, the wood, the gold, the wood, gold, the food ratio is like one to one. So I, I just say like fifty on gold, fifty on wood, forty on wood, something like that. As far as um like um late game trash is usually like seventy or eighty on wood. Depends on how much. <laughs> depends on how much cavalry you're making, because cavalry is all food. So if you're making like really heavy cavalry, then you're gonna be a lot heavier on wood, food even up to like the 80 90 food if you have like a lot of um cavalry but like 70 is probably a, but again don't go for that right away that's like late game um 
be on like mid game paladin stuff like that uh it's like 50 champions again it's like 40 45 somewhere in there um what other food units um yeah just basically those two somewhere between like 45 50 is usually pretty good so again like early game stay like 30 if you're massing something like that um if you're going for just like straight range unit like like um koreans you wouldn't really do any on food because you start with so much food in the beginning right uh you just really don't use it with koreans because you just invest so much in siege so just about going on heavy on gold and wood and uh yeah and then yeah and then like usually for stone i think for like taking map control and stuff like that having like seven to ten on stone is usually pretty good you get a castle every so you basically get the stone for a castle every so often it's pretty it's usually pretty reasonable um wood for like paladin sieves like usually if you're going for like 50 60 on farms you or 50 50 60 on wood on farms yes usually you don't need that many on wood it's probably like 20 25 so if you're just doing that if you're going like again a heavy siege stuff like that that stuff's going to cost a lot more wood but um usually if you're just having to supply farms and stuff like that it's not a big deal it's like 25 on wood is it's pretty good um this is a long video about nothing um what else like a team game uh this is just like random shit now in a team game if you're doing like market trade or something like that you want to make sure that your houses and stuff aren't getting in the way so like remaking houses on like the back side or something like that just to keep them out of the way of the trade it's pretty important getting markets up early in team games is good because it's uh, if you lose map control of your forward golds then you have trade to back you up which is good for you in team games i think i talked about it earlier but just like opening with more barracks usually is a better idea because if you get double rush you really want to make sure you have the helms up and and like we talked about, sometimes the stables aren't good. If they have like better rushing sieves than you, sometimes just opening with barracks is a safer option. Because if you get open with stables and then like um, they have a better rushing sieve and you're getting doubled, having those extra helms would have been really nice on betting. <laughs> um, other team game related stuff. I don't know. Yeah, getting the market up is, is definitely important. Um... Just unit trait like um, against Arbalest, any all the range units. Andre basically counters all of them. Siege is all like Siege Ram is also nice to like t soak damage. So just like soaking, just having a couple Rams for soaking is nice. Like they can kill with Onager, I guess, but but it's, they still soak a lot of damage in the meantime. Like I don't know what the value is. Like the thing is, is like let's say they have you have a Ram just in front of your range units, and they have range units as well, and they have Onagers. Okay, well they're gonna kill your onager probably with the with the they're gonna kill your ram with the onager, but I think like the seed the ram will soak up like enough damage that would have probably killed like four or five of your range units, which is probably like three hundred fifty resources or something like that. So that's more than the ram itself. So just adding in like rams every once in a while just to soak the damage is probably quite good, especially again when when. Uh, just in general against a lot of range units. I think onagers and having the ramps to soak is fine. The only times the ramps aren't going to be that great is if they have like a really strong anti, you know, if they have like a lot of onagers or if they had like a lot of cavalry or something like that, maybe the ramps aren't going to do as good a job because they can still micro their cavalry to attack your cavalry and then the, see the cavalry, or they can micro their archers against your archers to so they don't attack the rams and then the cavalry just kill the rams. But other than that, um, if they're just making a lot of Cal, um, range units but not a lot of like units that can kill rams then it's probably good to make them i, I think like i said helps do probably okay in the beginning um, maybe even champions are are, be are better but if you don't have um if if you don't have uh if you're not against a cavalry use of yourself um and you're just trying to get like a bit more efficiency or you know conserve some of the gold efficiency of your paladins or something then maybe just making some helps in the beginning to tank the uh, other helps can be okay. I think that's probably a good thing to do. I probably wouldn't match them barrack for barrack or anything like that. I, th I think that it's better to just um, met, like sit behind castles, use your maybe use like mobility or something to your advantage with paladins, and um, sit behind castles and master your gold units, and then it would just overrun them like uh, 
overrun the helps and everything like that because again we said that like one for one paladins are going to trade better against helps so if you just mass the paladins and then fight the helps like cost efficiency wise you'll take a really that'll be a really good for you um gold efficiency wise obviously it's not good but cost efficiency wise like it's going to be good and you should be able to win later on so that's probably the one way basically the two ways again to play against the two ways to play against somebody that is gonna you know is not going cavalry but is making a lot of helps is one is to make helps yourself to just kind of counter that or champions probably even are, again they're decent champions probably actually the better unit let's be let's be real here it just costs more gold so that's the only problem there maybe you market or something get the gold and then fight your champions but anyways uh or just like i said play defensive massive gold units and just over overrun them um so yeah but onagers do really well against hda champions that helps uh, again they're they can do a good job early on for pushing but if they have like a really strong like number of like if they have a large number of range units or something like that then these units will melt quite quickly and like champions melt a little bit slower they're quite strong early on for like pushes against uh, melee units but but against like castles and stuff like that they just die fairly quickly and um you end up running out of you can run like you lose a lot of resources very quickly cavalry is obviously be easily countered by um uh halbs or heavy gamble usually heavy gamble is not so great uh because they can mix the, all those civs with paladin and get help as well so they can just mix paladin help and kills camel pretty nicely so um only use camel kind of as if, if you don't really have a pike pin option i guess or I don't know, I'm not really sure about that one. It seems like a really hard situation, to be fair. Um, elite Battle Elephants, all the elephant civs, except with the exception of um, Malay, don't get heresy, so you can always make monks to micro, uh, to, um, to trade better against bat, uh, to trade better against elephants. So it's just kind of an option. Step Lancers there, I think, kind of useless, to be fair. Sea Dram, Counters or Onagers, Cavalry, infantry basically other other rams so um yeah usually like i said i like to put, keep two siege workshops by castles and just make some onagers sometimes just in case i think that they're going to push me with rams or even traps just having the onagers there to snipe is or to attack, to prevent them from doing damage is a good it's the other kind of the risk thing the risk with siege ram is that if you do try to push uphill with siege ram and they have a lot of onagers then you do lose a lot of value without really doing much if you have the siege ram so um yeah that's like kind of another case for pushing with like trebs and onager instead of like siege ram is it just the fact that uh trebs and onager is just like it's a lot um like trebs kind of force the enemy if they're on a hill to come down to your level to be able to fight the trebs or whatever so you get a better you usually have more units more more units on level ground and then onagers obviously are um a good like offensive unit as well as defensive unit whereas like trebs are or, i mean sea drams are more of like an offensive unit but it's not like it doesn't have any potential to really do damage or whatever i, I don't know they're both like they can both can be offensive and defensive units but siege onager does a lot more damage so if they make siege ram and, and you make siege onager with maybe a couple of rams i don't know also i'd like to know what siege ram like siege ram sometimes though like onagers do counter siege ram but like usually people aren't going to commit to like a ton of onagers like for rams they'll probably make like four four or five at mo uh, around four or five like reasonably or in most cases but like there are some plays where you can mass like literally like 20 siege ram or something like that and then even that like counters onager like not directly they're probably not going to kill the onagers or anything like that but the thing is like 20 siege onager takes forever to kill with onagers and usually you can just kill the onagers with other units and with 20 siege rams like if you if they're like a raid dune or something like that even if they have onagers again they need like 50, they need like 10 11 onagers just to kill the siege rams so if you have like 20 siege rams and they have five onager you're just going to overrun them so sometimes like surprises like that with like mass siege ram can be quite good even though it is quite quite expensive but sometimes if you're like a civ disadvantage but maybe you get like siege ram or something like that going for like a play like that is quite can be quite nice just massing up siege in general is it's, it's, it's a risky play always but it's always like 
it's always like a high risk, high reward play. Same thing with like massive like 15 onagers. It, like it could be something that be could be quite easily countered by like a lot of cavalry. But at the same time, if you pull it off and they don't have the cavalry ready, it can do a lot of damage fairly quickly. Scorpions, so siege onager counters are going to be cavalry. Um, sometimes infantry can do decent. Range units are never a counter really to siege onager except for longbowmen. Um, castles do fine. Bombard cannons, although even bombard cannons, I think it still takes two hits to kill a siege onager in all cases. I think they kill a lot. They can kill normal onager in one hit, but siege onager, I think two, take two. So um, the best thing to do is just have cavalry, just like a uh, hussar like cat or whatever, and then bombard cannon, try to attack ground and stuff like that. Also, normal onagers, they don't kill siege onagers, I think, in one hit either, but. They can be a nice thing if, if you don't get uh, Siege Onager and you don't really have other counters, then Normal Onager can be decent. Heavy Scorpion, again, just going to kind of a bit Cavalry, Bombard Cannon, Onager. Bombard Cannon gets countered by a lot of things, even Onager kind of countered with Bombard Cannon. I said it before, but in Deathmatch, you don't always have enough time to micro the Bombard Cannon, so like Siege Onager or Normal Onager can sometimes just snipe Bombard Cannons. Also, Trebs do good. Cavalry range units can get do good if they get in range. So. Yeah. Um, range text, just always be cognizant of those. We, there's not really a lot of water map and deathmatch and stuff like that, like Team Islands and stuff like that. The biggest thing actually you're looking for like in Team Islands is whether or not you get Galleon and Bracer, and then Shipwright is also important. Shipwright just makes the ships cheaper. Um, but yeah, Galleon and Bracer, those are pretty essential. Uh, so, but yeah, water maps aren't really too thought about or too, play, too much played. Um, the text here. We talked about Bombard Towers. Usually not going to use them unless it's a non mirror, but even then, I'd still probably say try to go without them if you can. They delay games a lot, especially team games. They're kind of annoying because they can delay games a lot more longer than they would have been otherwise. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll know your unique units. Monk technologies, again, monks aren't really that useful, but again, if you're playing against, like I said, like a Siege Onager and even have other counters and you got, like, Redemption plus, like, block printing monks or something like that, but block printing gives them extra range, then maybe that could be a counter to Siege Onager. It's like, it could be, like, one of your best options, even though it's not, still not that great, but yeah. These, all these techs are useless. So yeah, I think that kind of covers, yeah, elephants are counter by helps, camels do okay, pals get shredded. Eagles, did we talk about that? Eagles get countered by champions, paladins, other infantry that's got bonus, not helms. Eagles counter all trash. Eagles get destroyed by elephants. Um, infantry also gets killed by Siege Onagers pretty well. Like um, Heavy Scorpion and, and Siege Onager actually do quite well against infantry because at some point when you mass enough Siege Onager, like you can shoot, you can attack ground so many shots that like if they come at you with infantry, you just basically kill all. So uh, like usually see like siege onager is quite vulnerable to like when it's in low numbers because it's like they can just do spread formation and come at you and you can't kill all of them, so they usually just kill the onager. But like if you get enough siege onager, like you can do enough attack grounds around your onager where they kind of become like a self-defending unit even against like cavalry. So that's another thing. That's another thing. Another strength of siege onager. Siege tower ain't be really used at all. Um, I was gonna say something, but I forgot now. I know this video is long. Hopefully, you guys learned something. Uh, champion, like I said before, champions with the split pushing hand cannon here is basically useless. Um, Asars will be good for late raiding later. Remember to, remember to keep your compositions, like basically for split pushing, avoid using range units or building ranges on the flanks. So try to stick to making stables and barracks. That, that's usually a better combo. And then rams are fine. Again, split pushing is all about the just getting them to react. It's not so much about unit compositions as much. Just getting them to react is, like having them not react is, is very important. Um, See. I don't know, I feel like I had something to say, but I can't remember who it was. 
treadmill crane. Treadmill crane is important for like early game build ups. Like sometimes people will put two build two villagers on the first building instead of just one. That can be nice to help get up like helps or something faster or your first cavalry faster to raid or whatever. But for most part, I just stick at two. <laughs> something they'll look at later, maybe. Yeah, I don't really know of anything else to say, honestly. I feel like, like I feel like I was gonna say something, but I don't remember what it was. Now I'm sad. Um, yeah, I would just say just remember to look over the sets, try to really understand where they're at in the game. That's so important to be becoming a better player. Um, it, I don't even know all the stuff with these sets. There's so many sets and so much to, so much different strategy. But just thinking about it is. It's a good. It's a good thing. Oh yeah, I was gonna talk about hills. So this is something that's not always super pertinent to uh, deathmatch, but when you're defending against um, so when you're playing like castles on hills against um, so let's say you're defending, you have a castle on a hill, and you're defending against a a player that's trebbing you down, right, or trying to treb you. Let's say you have trebs, they have trebs. You're on a hill, they're not on a hill. What do you do? All right. Um, well, it's actually fairly obvious what you do with your trebs. So if they're if, you, if they're attacking you just with trebs, and you're defending with trebs, use your trebs to shoot their trebs. I think the accuracy is like 16% with the trebs, um, which is fine. They basically have like 100% accuracy with hitting your castle. So make sure you repair your castle, but um, but shoot their trebs for sure. Um, the only time. Gonna say oh yeah let's say you're in a so yeah yeah if they're attacking your traps then make sure you deploy your traps to defend your um like that's the one way that's like one like i see a pull, like i i avoid i miss doing it a lot but like a lot of times they have traps i have traps but i don't actually deploy my traps to shoot theirs i just have my traps chill and don't do that your traps are literally useless if they're not if they're not attacking the traps like you can keep them back here and defend but it'd probably be better just to hold the position so yeah, but like, let's say you're in a case where you're attacking uphill, um, and they have trebs and they're shooting at you, and you're shooting at the castle. Um, it's probably best, yeah, just to shoot at the castle. Like honestly, like the way it works is that, like, um, shooting at the trebs is actually the most cost-efficient thing to do. But the problem is, is if they repair the trebs, then um, if they repair the trebs, then uh, it's actually less cost-effective to attack the trebs than it is the castle. Um, so that's kind of one of the things you can think about. Like, if, if they don't have any villagers around to repair the trebs, or if they're not repairing the trebs, then just attack the trebs first and then kill the castle. But if they're, um, if they're repairing the trebs, then just kill the castle. Or, yeah, because they'll be more cost efficient usually. I don't know. It's kind of hard. Yeah, just, just try to kill the castle, especially if you have more army. If you have, like, a military advantage, then but maybe you just can't engage because the castle's there, like you can't overtake the, you don't have the military advantage when they have the castle, then just focus on killing the castle. But if you don't, well, you wouldn't be attacking. Uh, like if you both had castles and you're both fighting with trebs, then, yeah, if you don't have the military advantage, then you definitely need to kill their trebs, because if they kill your castle, then they're going to kill your treb anyways. So you have to kill the treb. The other thing I would say maybe is if they, um, if you had a lot of trebs, it might just be better to go shoot their trebs instead. Because the thing is, is that by the time, like I said, kill, killing the attacking the trebs is the most cost efficient. But the thing is, is oftentimes once they, if they start repairing the treb, then it's not, not as cost efficient. But if you have like six trebs or something like that, then, then uh, you basically kill the trebs instantly. You're probably gonna kill it within like two shots, which they they won't be able to react in time to repair it. So. You can just kill the trebs, or if you like Britons or something, or Huns, where they have increased accuracy on their trebs, it's better just to shoot the trebs because you're going to kill them basically instantly. And then you don't have to worry about them shooting you anymore. Whereas if you attack the castle instead, then um, if you attack the castle instead, then uh, they're going to keep attacking, they're going to shoot their trebs at you. I don't know if that makes sense. They're, they're going to attack your trebs, and if they kill your trebs, maybe it delays your push, right? So, but if you had six traps, honestly, you could just kill a castle in like two seconds. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. So, anyways, that's, uh, 
that's not Trevor Warfare. Yeah, so Trevor Warfare, the way it goes is the cost efficiency way it goes is okay. Just to start again. But the most cost effective thing to do in like a Treb Castle, Treb Castle War, the most cost effective thing to do is to attack a Treb that's not getting repaired. Because it takes a couple shots to kill them and they lose like 400 resources. Uh, second most cost effective thing to do is to attack the castle. Because if they're having to repair the castle, that co can cost them a lot of stone. And the third most, the least cost effective thing to do is to attack trebs that they're repairing. Because it only costs like half as much to repair the trebs. So they can like literally just, like you lose like 200 resources every like six shots basically. Because the, again the accuracy is quite low. But again it depends on the sieve too. Like again Britons have 100% accuracy with their trebs. So like shooting the trebs is the best because you get a lot of value out of just each shot. Same with Hans, the accuracy is increased as well. So a lot of, a lot of bonus there. A lot of uh, value you get from just killing the trebs quickly. But um, yeah, also, yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. I don't know. But the biggest mistakes people like I've been making is don't get the siege workshops up fast enough. Always important to get siege up fast onagers because like especially against if you're playing non-mirror sieves, other sieves can just overrun you with siege if they get really good siege really quick. So just getting siege up quick is really important. Um, the site like the secondary raids like I talked about, I'm not very good at it, but getting those paladins over there, trying to snipe them, preventing them from building those extra castles and stuff like that can be really good, especially if you have a good initial raid, because if you have a good initial raid and you have actually more army than them, because you had a good initial raid, and then you follow it up by delaying castles and stuff like that, sometimes you can just push them through, because they don't get the castles up, and then you delay the castles, and you kill all uh, you kill the castle with dreads, and you kill the whatever, like, it just can snowball like pretty quickly, so... Uh, yeah, try to make sure you don't get housed in the beginning. And I literally feel like I've talked about everything in deathmatch, but I know I haven't, but I don't really think there's anything to talk about. And like as the game gets later and later into the game, just try to focus on being more gold efficient. Like again, like you open the game with paladins, but like with the civic like hunts, like later on, you're not gonna keep, you're not gonna really make paladin anymore. Like you're just gonna focus on spending, keeping your gold into cav archer because it's gonna be the most cost, like gold efficient, or like siege ram. So like early on, um, you want to make the strongest army possible because if you don't, if you try to be too gold efficient in the beginning, then you just get overrun by stronger armies, and then they take that gold, like the extra gold from you and stuff like that, and then they win that way. But if you're not gold efficient enough later on, then you end up getting overrun in like uh, in like late game trash wars, especially like if you had like Britons and you had a bunch of longbowmen and you kept them alive and the other player didn't, like you're just gonna destroy the person in late game. So you kind of have to switch your priorities as the game goes on, right? Uh, yeah. So I know you guys are probably disappointed that I didn't um, show like actual games and stuff like that. It's kind of tough because I don't really have any recordings of games, but um, maybe in the future. Uh, I'll have some bit games, but uh, hopefully, again, I know, I apologize, I'm not very good at making, like, super, like, entertaining videos, but hopefully if you guys are smart enough, you guys learn a lot from these videos, and, um, and, uh, hopefully you can, uh, pick up on Deathmatch qu quite quickly. I, I definitely feel like with all the information I provided here that with some practice within a couple of weeks, anybody that is like had already played RM or even some some newer players could could still um could be like top hundred DMers within a couple of weeks for sure. So all right, well I think that's gonna conclude. Uh, I'll make like I said maybe maybe a market video later on or, or something like that as I get better at DM. But um I ho hopefully these videos have get, given y'all a, a really good start at um, DM. And like I said before, I'll link the DM gaming Discord in in the description and. Uh, if you have any more questions, you can find me there, and there's other people there that you can ask questions for. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the series, and I appreciate you guys watching if you did. So, uh, I'll guys catch you guys in the next uh, videos. Peace.